So we've been speaking about this boundary between bits and atoms. So let me ask you one of the about one of the big mysteries of consciousness. Do you think it comes from somewhere between that boundary? I won't name names, but if, <laughs> if, if you if you know who I'm talking about, it's probably clear. I once did a drive, in fact, up up to the Mussolini era villa outside Torino. Um, in the early days of what became quantum computing with uh, a, a famous person who thinks about quantum mechanics and consciousness. Mm -hmm. And we had the most infuriating conversation that went roughly along the lines of consciousness is weird, quantum mechanics is weird, therefore quantum mechanics explains consciousness. Mm. <laughs> that was rough, roughly the, the logical process. And you're not satisfied with that process? No, and I say that very precisely in the following sense. Uh, I was a program manager, somewhat by accident, in a DARPA program on quantum biology. Mm -hmm. And so biology trivially uses quantum mechanics that were made out of atoms, but the distinction is in quantum computing, quantum information, you need quantum coherence. And there's a lot of muddled thinking about like collapse of the wave function and claims of quantum computing that garbles just quantum coherence. That that um, that you can think of it as a wave that has very special properties, but these wave-like um, properties. And so there's a small set of places where biology uses quantum mechanics in that deeper sense. Mm -hmm. One is how light is converted to energy in mm -hmm. photosystems. Um, it looks like one is olfaction, how your nose is able to tell different smells. Um, probably one has to do with how birds navigate, oh, sure. um, how they sense magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. um, that involves a coupling between a very weak energy with a magnetic field, coupling into chemical reactions. And there's a beautiful system. It, it, Standard in chemistry is uh, magnetic fields like this can influence chemistry, but there are biological circuits that are carefully balanced with two pathways that become unbalanced with magnetic fields. So each of these areas are expensive for biology. It has to consume resources to use quantum mechanics in this way. Mm -hmm. So again, those are places where we know there's quantum mechanics in biology. In cognition, there's just no evidence. There, 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 there's... Uh, there's no evidence of anything quantum mechanical going on in how cognition works. Consciousness. Well, I'm saying I'm saying cognition. I'm not saying consciousness. Okay. But to, to get from cognition to consciousness, so McCullough and Pitts made a model of neurons mm -hmm. um, that led to perceptrons that then, through a couple boom busts, led to deep learning. One of the interesting things about that sequence is it diverged off. So deep neural networks used in machine learning diverged from trying to understand how the brain works. Um, what, what makes them work, what's emerged is, they, they, it, it's a really interesting story. This may be too much of a technical detail, but it has to do with function approximation. That, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, we had talked about exponentials, a deep network needs an exponentially larger shallow network to do the same function. Mm -hmm. And that, that exponential is what gives the power to deep networks. But what's interesting is the sort of lessons about building these deep architectures and how to train them have really interesting echoes to how brains work. Mm -hmm. And there's an interesting conversation that's sort of coming back of neuroscientists looking over the shoulder of people training these deep networks, seeing interesting echoes for how the brain works, interesting parallels with it. And so I, I didn't say consciousness, I just said cognition, but that I don't know any experimental evidence that points to anything in neurobiology that says we need quantum mechanics. And, um, I view the question about whether a large language model is conscious as silly in, in, in that biology is full of hacks 
and it works. Mm -hmm. there, there's no evidence we have that there's anything deeper going on than just this sort of stacking up of hacks in the brain. And somehow consciousness is one of the hacks or an emergent property of the hacks. Absolutely. And um, just numerically, I said big computations now have the degrees of freedom of the brain. Mm -hmm. And they're showing a lot of the phenomenology of what we think is properties of what a brain can do. Um, and I don't see any reason to invoke anything else. That makes you wonder what kind of beautiful stuff digital fabrication will create. If biology created a few hacks on top of which consciousness and cognition and some of the things we love about human beings was created, it makes you wonder what kind of beauty in the complexity can yeah, create so through digital fabrication. There's, there's an early peek at that, which is um, there's a misleading term, which is generative design. Mm -hmm. Generative design is where you don't tell a computer how to design something, you tell the computer what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work, that only works in limited subdomains. Uh, you can't do really complex functionality that way. Mm -hmm. The one place it's matured though is topology optimization for structure. So let's say you wanted to make a bicycle mm -hmm. or a table. Um, you describe the loads on it and it figures out how to design it. Mm -hmm. And what it makes are beautiful, organic looking things. These are things that look like they grew in a forest mm -hmm. and they look like they grew in a forest because that's sort of exactly what they are, that they're, they're, they're solving the ways of how you handle loads in the same way biology does. And so you get things that look like trees and shells and all of that. And so that's a peak at this transition to um, fr from we, we design to, to we teach the machines how to design.